Thank you all for coming. Um, I mentioned to Melissa that there's a large amount of interest inside this building in this book. And uh, uh, that appears to be true throughout the broader Washington policy community as well, which is wonderful. Um, thank you to all of you for taking time to be here. Thanks to the folks who are joining uh, us via the live stream. And thanks to everybody who will watch the video of this event uh, later in the future. It'll be available within 24 hours uh, in full. I'm Michael Strain, the Director of Economic Studies here at AEI. Uh, and we are all here to discuss Melissa Carney's important new book, The Two-Parent Privilege, How Americans Stopped Getting Married and Started Falling Behind. Uh, I have a copy of it here. The uh, leaves are starting to change. Many of you are probably starting to think about Christmas presents. This is a great one. Don't discount the importance of Halloween gifts. <laughs> Little kid comes to your door, you know, wants some candy, just drop one of these in the Halloween, Halloween candy basket. It'll, it'll help the kid in the long run. Um, I'm not even kidding. Uh, uh, the run of show for this event uh, will, be, will be quite straightforward. Melissa will come up to the podium here and present on the book for uh, 20 minutes or so, and then her and I will um, uh, discuss uh, all the things that she, uh, that she didn't talk about in the presentation uh, and some questions that I have. And we'll be sure to save plenty of time for questions from the audience, from the in-person audience. Uh, the virtual audience can submit questions uh, using the, the Twitter or X hashtag, hashtag AskAEIEcon. Uh, or you can email your questions to john.tui at aei.org. John, the spelling of that email address is available on the event webpage. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a good, a good discussion. Let me briefly introduce Melissa. Melissa S. Carney is the Neil Moskowitz Professor of Economics at the University of Maryland and the director of the Aspen Economic Strategy Group. Carney's academic research focuses on domestic policy issues, especially issues related to social policy, poverty, and inequality. Her work, her work has been published in leading academic journals and has been cited frequently in the popular press. She has testified before Congress uh, on the topic of US income inequality. Melissa, I think, is one of the uh, most impressive and most important economists who plays a role in the broader public square. I think Melissa is a model for how to do that. Uh, she always gets her facts right, uh, but she is uh, able to marshal those facts in the service of better policy uh, and ultimately better lives for more Americans. And I think that this book is a great example of Melissa at her best, and Melissa at her best really is, I think, the economics profession at its best. So let me uh, 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 thank Melissa for being here and invite her up to the stage. Um, thanks so much, Michael, for having me and for that very generous introduction, I hope. I mean, I feel like I can only go down from here, so hopefully I don't disappoint after that. Um, so what I want to talk about are some of the themes in my new book, The Two-Parent Privilege. Um, and I want to situate the book uh, in, in the really in the motivating context in which I wrote it and the topics that led me to write this book, and that's inequality in social mobility in America. And so this has really been a focus of mine for my 20 plus years as an economist and a researcher and somebody interested in US public policy. And the reason I came to this book was because I've spent now um, you know, two plus decades attending policy focused conversations, some even in this room, about income inequality and social mobility in America. And in my experience, which I realize might be different for some who run in different circles, but in my experience, those conversations tend to focus on sort of the typical economic policy prescriptions that we as economic policy folks know how to really sort of contend with. And we'll often make prescriptions about how we need a stronger safety net, we need to improve schools, we need affordable housing, we need to increase access to college, affordable college, criminal justice reform, all these things that I am excited to talk about and I think are really important. But again, in my experience, there was this elephant in the room, which was when you look at what's driving gaps in kids' outcomes in this country and really leading to differences in opportunities and experiences and life trajectories, 
different family structure and a wide class divergence now in kids having access to two parents in their home was really a big part of the story. And again, in my experience, when this sort of factor would come up in these conversations, because maybe one or two or three of us would skittishly throw it out there, it was pretty summarily dismissed. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. There's been some really um, unproductive conversations about the topic of family structure in the US over the past 50 years. It's also harder for us as economists to think about, well, what do we do about it? <laughs> we could come up with lots of very easy, straightforward ways to make the tax code more progressive or to make college more affordable, but it's really harder to think about strengthening families. And, and that's sort of what I challenged myself to do in this book, was to marshal all of the data and evidence that we have on this topic, put it out there as something that I think is tremendously important, and hopefully put forward a way for us as people interested in, in economic policy making to think about in a way that feels like maybe it could be productive and not just mired in culture wars. So what I want to do with my time at the podium is just to lay out a bunch of the facts that I really highlight in the book to say, here's what we're talking about. And then I'm, I'm hoping that when we have our conversation, we can talk more about well, how do we think about these trends and what, what maybe can we do about them. So the first motivating fact is really what I see as a seismic shift in the way kids are being raised in this country. And that is the decrease in kids over the past 40 years who are now living in a married parent home. So in 1980, 77% of US kids lived in a married parent home, and now it's 63%. And really importantly, again, in the interest of just laying out the facts, this is not because US parents are now just cohabitating and essentially raising their parents in a married parent structure, just not in name. You can see in the census data that only 8% of kids live with what looks like cohabiting parents in the census. And I want to be clear, because that even overstates the case, because in the census, we see someone as having unmarried parents if they're living with one biological parent and that parent's unmarried partner. And in about a quarter to 40% of cases, that unmarried partner is actually not the child's second biological parent. Okay, so my point here is 63% of kids live in married parent homes now. 8% live with one parent and their unmarried partner that may or may not be the child's second parent, biological parent. And the next, you know, behind married parents, the next most common family structure for a child in the US is an unpartnered mother. So that's a mother with neither a spouse or an, unpartnered, an unmarried partner present. And that's now more than one in five kids in the US. Okay, this is more than any other country in the world. Uh, it's more than three times the, national, the international average. So this is a uniquely American phenomenon, okay? And this one response to that is, well, sure, American mothers are richer. They can afford to do this on their own, and so we shouldn't be surprised. But a key thing that I highlight in the book is that it's not the most economically advantaged women in America who are finding themselves parenting alone most often, okay? In fact, we now have a very large college gap, what I call a college gap, in the share of children being raised in married parent homes. And this is a really key theme that I, that I sort of carry throughout the whole book. This is why this is an issue that anybody who is interested or concerned about income inequality and eroding social mobility in the US needs to contend with. So 84% of kids in the US who live with a mom who has a four-year college degree now live with married parents. And of course, who has a college degree now is a much broader uh, swath of the population than 40 years ago. So in some sense, the fact that this share has held fairly steady is a bit surprising, right? It, it's moms, now about 30% of moms have a four-year college degree as compared to 11% in the past, so it's a less selective group. And yet still we see a pretty, only a small share, a small decline in the share of kids to four-year college-educated moms living with married parents. The big story here is what's happened outside the college-educated class. And so if you look in 1980, there wasn't that big of an education gap, but still in the 80s and 90s, people were writing papers in the academic literature concerned about rates of single mother households among the most disadvantaged moms without a high school degree, typically teen moms. And now what you see is actually the story is not that the most disadvantaged moms look different, it's that college educated moms look different from everybody else. And the really large decrease that's been steadily, you know, steadily declined from 1980 through 2010 was the decrease in children whose moms have a high school degree or some college living with married parents. 
And this is noteworthy because, again, like 30, 40 years ago, our academic literature on single parenthood was really very tightly you know, bound with issues of teen childbearing and the most disadvantaged groups. This has now become a much more common living arrangement. And it's really the college educated who are living in, you know, with this privileged position of having two parents or married parents in the household. If we look at unpartnered mothers, the gap, the college gap doesn't go away. So here I'm counting basically the number of parents, the number of adults in the household rather than whether they're married. And you still see that sort of the middle has converged to the bottom in terms of education groups. And so now you know, about 30% of children whose moms don't have a four-year college degree are living with an unpartnered mother. And by the way, these unpartnered mothers are not, the majority of them are not making up for the absence of a second parent in the home by having another relative or a grandparent live with them. Okay, 67% of children who live with an unpartnered mother have no other adult in the household. So I don't want to discount the role of extended families, but it would be a mistake to think that people are choosing to live, you know, essentially they have, they have a mom and a grandma. The majority of them don't. The majority of them just have a mom. Okay, and I also want to point out that that's not just, as we'll see, difficult for the kids, but as one would readily imagine, that poses a lot of burden on the unpartner's mothers who are doing this by themselves. Okay, let's look at the college gap within race and ethnic groups. So in the 1980s, there were already, we saw in the 60s and 70s, differences emerge across black and white families in the US in terms of the number of kids being raised in married parent homes. That's something people focused on in the 80s. What has happened in the 40 years since is that within white families, black families, and Hispanic families, there's been a decrease in the share of kids living with married parents across the board, but that has been much larger among not the children of non-college educated mothers. And so you can see here, there's a college gap, you know, 88% of the children of white mothers who have a four-year college degree live, in, degree live in married parent homes compared to you know, 60% or 69% of others. Um, among children of black mothers, 60% of those whose mothers have a four-year college degree live in a married parent home, only half that share for mothers who don't have a college degree. And Asian Americans here are a notable exception. That's the, you know, of these four large groups, which I can see in the data, uh, we don't see this college gradient, interestingly, among the children of Asian mothers in the US. This divergence in family structure is both a response to the forces that have led to income inequality, which I'll talk about, but also it has amplified income inequality and it's undermined economic security of the group we might have thought of as middle class. And so here's just some really basic numbers to make that point. In the top, in the top panel, what I'm showing you is something more typical of what we would do as labor economists, which is let's hold family structure constant and see what happens to household earnings, looking at households that have two parents. Okay? And there we see that household earnings among households headed by a mom with a four-year college degree increased by 59%. For the middle group, it increased by 8%. And for the bottom group, it decreased by 14%. So this will be familiar to anyone who has followed the labor economics literature about this. We've got widening earnings inequality, right? College educated are doing really well. The middle is doing you know, a little bit better, maybe stagnant earnings. And the bottom is not doing as well over 40 years. All right. If we just look at unpartnered mothers, we see that all of them are doing better now in terms of their household earnings than 40 years ago. Again, that's not a surprise. College educated mothers have about, unpartnered mothers have about 60% more earnings. Why? Because college educated workers, both men and women have done really well over this time period. For the middle group, their earnings have gone up 19% and for the bottom group, their numbers have gone up 24%. What's happening here? Well, we know all about you know, welfare form, the EITC, unpartnered mothers are working more than they used to. We also know that unpartnered mothers aren't as disadvantaged as they used to be in terms of the composition. So this shouldn't surprise us. In the bottom panel, what I'm showing you just very mechanically is what has happened to the earnings of households for moms, you know, headed by moms with a college education, a high school education, or less than high school. And I'm allowing family structure to move as it has in the real world. I'm not conditioning on the number of parents. And so here what we see is the college educated households are doing just as well. Why? Because they're almost as likely to have two adults in the household as 
40 years ago. The middle class, let's call them the middle group, the middle education socioeconomic group, instead of seeing an 8% or 19% rise in their household earnings, it's decreased by 4%. Why? Because those households now are 20 percentage points more likely to only have one adult in the household. And so that move away from having two parents in the household for that middle education group, high school educated moms, has undermined economic security, more so than just what would have happened from labor market trends. And the same is true for the less than high school to an even larger extent. All right, a few more things on mechanically what's driving this. Okay? This is not a story of more divorce. Divorce conditional and marriage is down. This is a story of fewer parents getting married in the first place. Right? So if we look at unpartnered mothers' marital status, between 1980 and 2019. In 1980, 64% of unpartnered mothers were divorced. Now that's only 39%. A small majority of unpartnered mothers have never been married. And we see this if we look across groups, but even here there's a college gap. So unpartnered college-educated mothers are more likely to have gotten there through divorce. They're, they're, you know, they're more likely to have been married to their child's father at some point and then split up. And again, the story I tell in the book is really about resources. And so even this matters for kids' experience, the fact that there's a college gap in the status of unpartnered mothers, because the children of divorced parents are more likely to have had the benefit of two parents' resources in their home, and they're more likely to be receiving child support and have engagement with their second parent. Okay? So this increase in never married is really important to realize in terms of what is driving the trends, but also in thinking about how they affect children. Okay, the other thing I do in the book, which I don't have time to do right now, is to, is to make it very clear that none of this is being driven by an increase in birth rates to groups with high likelihoods of single motherhood. Okay, teen births are way down. Teen births are down over 70% from the mid-1990s. This is huge. If you told me in the mid-1990s that teen births were going to fall as much as they did, I would have expected that the share of kids growing up in a, with a single mom would have fallen, okay? Teen births are, I mean, births are down to basically all women under the age of 30. The only women who are having more births than they did in the past are women over the age of uh, 30, but they still make up a smaller share of births, so overall births in the U.S. are way down, okay? So it's surprising in some sense that we see such a large share in non-marital childbearing given the large decrease in births to young women. But nonetheless, the share of births that are outside of a marital union is now 40%. Okay? Uh, it's a huge increase from 18% in 1980. What is driving that? What's driving that, again, is the fact that an increasing share of parents have never been married. They're not married at the time of the child's birth, and they don't subsequently marry. So here is the rise in non-marital childbearing across education groups, you can see that this is actually doubled among mothers with a four-year college degree, but it's still only 11%. You can see that it increased from 52% to 66% among the least educated mothers. But this huge rise is this doubling of the share of births to women in this middle education group, high school grads or some college. Okay? There's been a doubling of the share of their births that are outside of a marriage. So what's really happened in the US is that we've experienced a debundling of having kids and being married right, for a large share of our population. That's the story here. It's not about a rise in birth to unmarried moms or teen moms. It's not about an increase in, in divorce. It's about a debundling of the institution of marriage from the act of having and raising kids outside the college educated class. And that's why I titled my book, The Two-Parent Privilege, because having two parents in the home has now looks like you know, a privilege or a luxury disproportionately experienced by the kids of college-educated parents. We can see that marriage is a key driver here. If we just look at what's happened to marriage shares, this is for all adults, not parents. I just showed you the shares for moms giving birth. In the 60s and 70s, when there were massive social and cultural changes, we see that there was a decrease in marriage that's roughly proportional across the education distribution. But then stunningly, what happens in the 1990s is that the share of adults married among college-educated, how do I go back, Michael? 
red button. No, the red button is going forward. That actually worked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that was funny. Okay, so um, the share, the married share stopped falling among the college educated, but it still fell for everybody else. Okay, so what's my read on what happened here in very broad strokes, but I go through this at some length in the book. In very broad strokes, we went into the 80s with a new set of social norms that, that really sort of de-emphasized traditional gender roles or the importance of marriage. And then in the 80s, non-college educated men got hit with a bunch of economic shocks that decreased their economic position in a level sense in some places, but also in a relative sense to the women that they would partner with. And that sort of decreased the value proposition of marriage for many people outside the college educated class. And so we saw this, you know, the new social norm forming where marriage wasn't as important as it used to be for having kids. We saw the economic value proposition for marriage between a man and a woman decrease outside the college educated class. And that produced this decoupling of childbearing and marriage in affected populations and areas. And we have a lot of evidence, you know, there's been really nice studies that show that there's a causal link here from the economic shocks that disadvantaged non-college educated men to an increase in the children living in single mother homes in the affected communities. And so now, we're in this new social paradigm where we've got this sort of social normalization of this debundling outside the college educated class. Women continue in many instances, again, pre predominantly outside of college educated adults where the economic value proposition has been weakened. And so I, I think, you know, ultimately it will be hard to reverse trends. But the reason I wrote this book is because I think these are really important. When you look at those class and racial and ethnic gaps, it's pretty hard to say that we could do much to address the inequality in kids' household resources and outcomes uh, if, we don't, if, we, if we don't tackle this divergence in family structure. So we know this matters for kids. It's not just about income. Income is a big part of the story, but not all of it. Married parents also, because there's two of them, they have more time and emotional energy of course, the context and situation matters, right? And so, you know, again, in one of the chapters, I highlight this with an economic model in support of empirical evidence. The benefits of having married parents or two parents in the home for a kid will depend on what the mother sort of brings, her own level of resources, what resources the partner would bring. So if, you know, we're talking about two teen parents, neither whom have graduated high school, who both have pretty limited prospects, the idea that them getting married would then help them get their kids through college is not so, you know, it's, it's probably unlikely. If we're talking about an older mother with a high level of education and high earnings, she's almost surely able to keep her kid out of poverty on her own. But where we saw the biggest decrease was in the middle. When we're talking about someone with a high school degree, and, you know, typically they'll partner with someone else with a high school degree. And that's where you might have the biggest impact of combining the resources of two people. And in fact, this is just unadjusted data from the PSID, but it's based on a study I did with Phil Levine, and we have one where it's all in, you know, a typical uh, regression adjusted. I'm just showing you the gaps unadjusted to, to get the intuition out there. In the top panel, I'm showing you the percent of children with a high school degree by age 20. And in the bottle, I'm looking at the percent of children with a college degree by age 20, by age 25. And what you see is that the biggest gap between the likelihood that a child graduates high school between the child of unmarried mother versus married mother is actually in the middle of the distribution, moms with a high school degree or some college, precisely where we've seen marriage decrease the most. The largest gap in the percent of children with a college degree is in the highest two groups, moms with some college or moms with a college degree. Why? Because very few children whose mothers don't have a college degree actually graduate college. That's a pretty high marker. It's pretty hard to achieve getting someone through college. And so again, we see the college educated class pulling away. You've got two parents in the household throwing tons of resources at the kids. They're more likely to be prepared for college and get through college. And so this is why this is such a, in my view, an important issue for income inequality. I mean, I want more for these kids than just keeping them out of poverty, right? Yes, we can expand the child tax credit and keep more kids out of poverty. But really, what I'd like to see is these gaps in college completion close. 
and that's going to be a taller order. All right, what can and we couldn't do? I'm going to tell you in 30 seconds, and then hopefully we can talk about it. You know, here's the most controversial thing I say in the whole book, I think. I do think we need to foster a norm of two-parent homes for children, right? And for a lot of people, that's a tough pill to swallow. But I actually do think that being honest that this is a beneficial family structure for kids is important, and that will allow us to spend more energy and time and public funds and research efforts thinking about ways to do that, to build up families, to help unmarried couples with relationship challenges, with co-parenting challenges. I don't think we should accept a new reality where the two-parent family is a thing of the past for less educated lower-income Americans. And I, again, I think that's a big point of disagreement between me and, and others. Um, I don't think we should bemoan the economic independence of women. You will never hear me say, well, gosh darn it, if women just didn't go to work, they would have had to stay in these crappy marriages. I think we can hold two thoughts in our heads at the same time. The you know, economic empowerment of women has been a great thing. The economic disadvantage of non-college educated men and what that's done for family life outside the college educated class has been a bad thing. Um, I don't think we should stigmatize single mothers or encourage unhealthy marriages, of course. But there has to be a way where we could talk about the need to strengthen families without doing that. Um, I will leave it at that and, and leave the rest for us to discuss. Thanks. I'll let you make it go away. They'll be able to figure that out. <laughs> OK. Well, I regret scheduling this event for 60 minutes rather than 90, but I have no one to blame for that but myself, <laughs> uh, because I think there's so much uh, to talk about. Um, where to start? Let me, let me tell you uh, an experience that I've had that you, that you probably have had too. I have found that it is becoming easier when talking to social scientists, professional social scientists, to get them to acknowledge that having two adults with income earning potential in the household creates better outcomes for kids than one adult. Um, so they will, they will go up to that point. But they will say, it doesn't matter if the two adults are married. They can be cohabiting. It doesn't matter if the two, some will say, it doesn't matter if the two adults are cohabiting, as long as you know, maybe it's a brother and a sister, or a you know, mother and a grandmother, that what really matters is the income. And you just said that the income certainly matters but that the income is not all that matters. And I wonder, how can I convince these social scientists that it's not just the income? Yeah, there's actually a lot to unpack in what you just said, so I'm gonna start at the beginning, mm -hmm. which is, it is true that you know, most academics who talk about these social problems readily admit that in the data, we of course see that kids from two-parent households benefit, but then when you get to the question of what to do about it, mm -hmm is when it's sort of shut down. And if you just think it's income, then we get back to talking about all the other things we talk about. Because then mm -hmm. it's like, well, we just need a more progressive tax code. Mm -hmm. We need to tax people and transfer more to single parents and close the gaps. Mm -hmm. And so that's why whether you think it's all income or not really matters from the policy conclusions you draw. Mm -hmm. Again, there's been lots of studies. OK, spoiler alert, I did not run an RCT. That is not in the book. So to those who like still refuse to believe anything. That's because it's illegal. OK, you could defend me on you, why I'm, I didn't I'm do it. I'm defending you. But there are still you people who You can't randomly like, assign people to get married and true. not to get married. Right, or to live together with their kids. We live in a free society. But there are still people who just, if you don't have an RCT, they don't believe it's causal. Mm -hmm. So what I do to try and get at that in the book is to muster all this evidence of like, let's look at all of the things we see differ. So, so when you run your regression and you control for income, a lot of the gaps, and a lot of people in this room have run such regressions, a lot of the gaps in the kids' outcomes shrinks. They don't go away, but they shrink. Mm -hmm. So again, income is an important determinant. But let's just pause on that for a minute because in the real world, we don't hold income constant. Mm -hmm. And so making it go away isn't as clever as one might think because mm -hmm. in the real world, even if we have a stronger safety net, we're not gonna close these income gaps, yep. right? Okay, so that's part of it. But then also, there are tons of studies. Well, first of all, you can't make the income gaps go, you can't make the gaps in kids' outcomes go away with just income. Mm -hmm. So there's something else driving those differences. There are a lot of studies giving really good hints as to what those other mechanisms might be. Parental time use is one of them. Mm -hmm. Kids with married parents or two parents, 
and then we'll get to your cohabitation point. Mm -hmm. For now, let me use them interchangeably. Kids with married parents or two parents, they have more parental time. And then, because we don't accept anything that like we might think as parents that our time with our kid is actually beneficial, there are some studies showing that reading to your kid actually helps them do better in school, that mm -hmm. like your parental time actually matters to kids' outcomes. There are also a lot of studies focused on you know, mostly low-income single mothers that, and these are not in economics largely, in sociology and child development, talking about the role of stress and instability in mm -hmm. those households. And those things are bad for, you know, stress is really hard on moms. We, and, you know, stress is hard on moms. We see it in the data. And then we see, and anyone who's been a parent probably will immediately recognize this, it's much harder to parent the way you want to and do all the things you know you should be doing if you're stressed. Mm -hmm. And in the literature, there's different ways of calling this and the models are some, some different, like toxic stress means a particular thing in one literature and economists talk about cognitive bandwidth, right? But the general idea is if there's another person there to help pay the bills, to help take care of the kids, to help do all the household production stuff, it's easier to find the time and space to nurture your parent, kids, not yell at them, don't use harsh parenting, do all the things that the parenting books and child psychologists tell you you're supposed to do. Okay? My kids so, are good at, at exceeding my cognitive. Yes, <laughs> right, right, that's right. They do that They do that most days. And so again, it's not, I mean, there, there are studies showing that stress is higher in under-resourced homes, um, which are, you know, if single parent homes are more likely to be under-resourced, but that stress makes it hard to parent and it, and it shows up in kids' outcomes. Um, so that, so that's why, like, there's all these obvious mechanisms. Still doesn't tell us what to do about it, mm -hmm. but it's not hard to realize. So time, attention, time, attention, a less stressful environment, all those things. There's also more stability. More stability. All those things are independent of income. Yeah. Those are those are in addition to income. So those could be some and income like they're all associated, right? They're if you have a lot of income, it's easier to pay people mm -hmm. who isn't a spouse to yeah. do things, so you have more time with your kids. So they're they're all connected, which is why it's really hard to disentangle. Mm -hmm. But married parent households tend to bring this whole bundle of resources. So then I think the the next phase of the argument would go, okay, but why marriage? Yeah, good. Why why not why not cohabitation? If parents cohabited through their kid's childhood and pooled all their resources as if they had a long-term contract to do so but just never signed the contract, mm -hmm. then there wouldn't really be a difference in outcomes. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is that's not what cohabitation in the U.S. looks like. Mm -hmm. All right, So this is also something that the professional class usually will retort when faced with facts about the decline in marriage. Well, now we're you know, acting more European. Mm -hmm. But we're not really, because Europeans who cohabit as parents tend to stay together. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it looks like predominantly in the U.S. And so when you look at European countries, do you see a difference in kids' outcomes between married parents and cohabiting parents? I don't know about married parents and cohabiting parents, but what you can see is that in European countries, even like Denmark, that has a very, <laughs> uh, you know, a much stronger welfare state than us, those countries can do better keeping single moms and their kids out of poverty, mm -hmm. right? So that shows you we obviously could be doing a lot more to keep single moms and their kids out of poverty, and I'm all for that. Probably more than you, but I'm all for that, right? <laughs> On this stage, I am to the left of you. <laughs> That's right. Very clever. But, um, but, but you still see that parents' background and family background matters for kids' outcomes. Mm -hmm. So even in... Thicker welfare states, you still see a difference in kids' outcomes. And, and, and in the United States, uh, cohabiting isn't really an option in the data. I mean, you don't see... I don't know. Look, a lot of people, not me, mm -hmm. but there are people who study relationships and they have theories about why marriage is more sticky than cohabitation. Mm -hmm. And you can tell all sorts of theories why that would be, that like actually making the commitment matters. Sure beyond just the types of people being willing to make the commitment. Like mm -hmm. if you go into it saying we are together for the long haul, then when things get rough as they inevitably do, you work through them. Mm -hmm. And so- Sometimes the children make them get rough. Sometimes the children make them get rough. And so maybe that's particularly when having the contract or the ex-ante commitment, we're so romantic that we talk about <laughs> The ex-ante commitment is actually winds up being quite protective as an institution. So, mm -hmm. you know, another thing you could respond to this all and say is, well, maybe we need more legal structures in place 
to make cohabiting more binding or something. Mm -hmm. Like maybe that's the plan B, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, marriage is the institution on a practical data level that is most likely to deliver to parents in the home to kids throughout their childhood. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of cases where you're looking at, at single parenting, it's the mom who's doing the parenting. Are there, are there disproportionate effects of being raised by a single parent for, for boys and girls? Yes. But let's, I feel like that was a leading question. Thank you. So um, I have that in the book, and I'm happy to talk about it. But I also want to say. It was not a leading question. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to get you to an answer. OK, I have my answer. Thank you for asking the question. But I do want to say, first of all, uh, the fact that the majority of single parents I'm trying are, to drag you into the culture war by asking I, you if boys are worse than girls. I am, I'm, going to, I am going to avoid the culture war kicking and screaming. But one of the things I really want to avoid is you know, the fact that a majority of single parents are single mothers, when people hear, by raising this, you are blaming single mothers, mm -hmm. just the opposite. Those single mothers are their kids' biggest asset. Mm -hmm. And what I am saying is they are doing the job that those of us who are lucky enough to have a spouse or a partner in the house, there's two of us doing. And so, you know, I I'm also, because I don't like culture wars. I'm also not in the book actually really blaming the dads, the non-resident dads. I think there's, you know, a lot of barriers in a lot of instances for why people aren't married, why they're, tr why they're not co-parenting effectively. Um, but to the extent that, you know, it's, it really strikes me as bizarre that we don't want to ask the question, where are all those dads? Why are they not in the home? Like, don't the kids deserve that we at least ask that question as social policy analysts? So that's, that's one thing. Um, okay, so there are a couple really good studies from the past, let's say, 10 years written by um, teams of economists that I know of um, showing that the absence of a dad from the home seems particularly harmful to boys' outcomes. Mm -hmm. Right. So one study I'm thinking of in particular is the study by Marianne Bertrand and Jessica Pond that's called The Trouble with Boys. And basically what they show is the, the gender gap in outcomes that now favors girls, such that girls are less likely to get in trouble at school, they're more likely to you know, perform better in school, that gap is bigger among kids growing up in single mother homes than in two parent homes or than in married parent homes. Um, and they look, so beyond just their, their really compelling documenting of that fact, they do a really interesting job trying to get at mechanisms. And the interesting thing they find is, and by the way, they're not the only ones who have documented this gap in kids' outcomes. So that fact is now pretty well established across a few studies. What they do is uh, look at mechanisms. And they do find that boys in single mother homes get less parental time. They're more likely to get harsh parenting, these other things outside of income that we talked about. They're more likely to get those sort of, sort of experienced parental deficits, but the real driver of the difference in outcomes is that they are particularly receptive to it. Mm -hmm. So boys, you know, it's almost seem like... Boys take it harder. Boys take it harder. Boys mm -hmm. take it harder. Now, I want to be careful. Uh, on average. On average. But also, on average, boys are more likely when they're struggling to engage in externalizing behavior, mm -hmm. like lashing out at school, doing the kinds of things that might get them in trouble in school or with the law. Girls are likely to, more likely to internalize it. So I don't want to say that girls aren't impacted as much, but we don't see it show up in like their educational performance or they're getting in trouble as mm -hmm. much. So uh, a few years ago, you uh, wrote one of the most depressing economics papers I've ever read. Oh, no. And you know, what, we, what we saw in your paper, to, to back up a bit, male earnings went down, marriage rates went down, we had a fracking boom, yeah. male earnings went up, Marriage did not go up. I know. And I wanted marriage to go up. I, mean, I thought that was going to go up. Why could you not find that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I went into that project, right? So I didn't have time to talk about this in the, in the talk in these terms. But one of the explanations for the decline in marriage, and I described it as, you know, a reduction in the economic value proposition. But this relates to William Julius Wilson's marriageable men hypothesis, right? The idea that... 
if there are fewer marriageable men around, and he just defines that in terms of economics, um, there will be less marriage in the affected group. And so the fracking boom, I was like, this is awesome. We've got an increase in marriageable men. More men are working in these communities and they have increased earnings. And by the way, this is joint work with Riley Wilson. And, and we're looking at counties that aren't in North and South Dakota because there you're thinking, well, those were migrants. That's different. We're, we look at all the other counties in the country that had these local fracking booms. And there you see an increase in non-college educated men's employment and earnings, not just in oil and gas extraction industries, but think of this as like localized economic booms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we document the facts. And then, so then you're like, this is great, reverse marriageable men, let's run non-marital birth share on the left-hand side of the regression. It doesn't budge. There's like no change. So- I bet I could get it to budge. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so so then, then you look at what happened to births and you see births went up, which kids are normal goods. Economists have shown that meaning when there's a positive income shock, people tend to have more kids, but it went up for unmarried and married adults in the same proportion. So we revisited the case of the coal boom and bust. A previous team of researchers, economists, had shown that in the coal boom and bust in the 70s and 80s in Appalachian coal towns, coal producing towns, when the coal boom happened and male earnings went up, married births went up. So we went back and said, okay, let's look at the marriage margin and non-marital births. And so very similar shock, very similar royal, rural communities 20 years earlier. Um, and then what happened there was married births did go up as the previous team of researchers found. Marriage went up, non-marital birth share fell. So I think this is why I also thought it was a little depressing or at mm -hmm. least it made me, it changed my priors. My priors were if we could just improve the economic position of non-college educated men, we'll see a reversal of this trend. And this finding sort of gave me pause and when you think about it more and then even look at the variation in sort of the effect of family formation response in the U.S. counties, what you realize now is we're in a new social paradigm. As I, you know, as I described it, there's been this social acceptance of the debundling of having kids from marriage such that now people respond to an economic shock differently. So they might decide to have kids, but it doesn't matter as much whether they're married or not. Mm -hmm. So that, that does make it, that leads me to the conclusion that it will take both social and economic changes to reverse some of these trends. So I, now I have some hard questions. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, so I, your story is that social attitudes have changed, culture has changed, and that affects the way that, uh, that people make decisions about family formation. It affects decisions about parenting. It affects the way that people respond to economic uh, uh, changes. And that seems very plausible to me, uh, that, that there's a large kind of social and cultural component to this. And so, you know, that kind of got me thinking, you know, what would I do if one of my really good friends told me that he was going to walk out on his kids? And what I would do is I would say, you know, don't do that. You have a responsibility to your kids. Oh, but I'm not getting along with their mom. Well, you know, work harder. I mean, these are the things I would say. I don't mean to, to trivialize in any way uh, how difficult marriage can be um, and uh, how hard it can be to stick with it. But just to be honest, if um, a, a very good friend of mine who I had a you know, very close relationship with came to me with that scenario, that's what I, that's what I would, would say. And I think we don't want to say that. Um, Wait, let me, can I change your scenario? What if your close friend said, hey, I got my girlfriend pregnant, but we're not going to get married? Because that's more what we see. Well, in that instance, I would say you should get married because otherwise you will never stay together. Uh, and you should stay together because you have to, you have to raise your kids. Um, and we don't want to, we don't want to stay that, we don't want to say that either. And so... You know, my question is, you have the, the do's and don'ts, things we can uh, or should do and things we can or shouldn't do. Um, should, we, should we add to your list of do's? You know, maybe, you know, ratcheting up the, I don't know if shame is the right word. Well, no, I said don't, don't. Look, I have foster a norm of two-parent no, homes, so I'm I know, with you. I, I know but if a friend of mine came mm -hmm. and said... I am pregnant mm -hmm. and I want to have this child, but the man I thought I was going to marry and have this child with 
is he's dealing with a lot of demons. Mm -hmm. He gets violent with me. Mm -hmm. I'd say stay the hell away. Yeah, violent, stay away. But let's so let's keep the focus on me. <laughs> um, that's where I like the focus to be. So so my friend comes to me and says, I've I've got my girlfriend pregnant but I'm not gonna get married to her. What I would say is you need to get married, you have a responsibility to the baby, the baby needs a father. I would not write that in an op-ed because of my cowardice. Now here I am you know, saying it on the internet, so maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm not that much of a coward. But that is, that is something I would say. Why, why shouldn't I feel uh, as free to say that in the public square as I would to say it in a private conversation? I think the, with all the caveats that if there's violence. Well, involved, I obviously. I think the issue is um, when you read the qualitative reports and interviews of people of unmarried couples, low income unmarried couples in particular, there are a lot of real barriers, and many of them say they do want to stay together. They would go to you and say, Michael, we want to stay together. We have no example of a healthy marriage in our lives. We didn't grow up that way. Our friends aren't doing that. Also. You know, I have a criminal record, so I'm sort of unstably employed. Mm -hmm. And um, she has some anger issues. Mm -hmm. There are real barriers, sure. right? And so one of my points is, like, we should scale up programs that show promise in strengthening families. Say what those are. Okay, so here's... I, I will give you some examples, but mm -hmm. the real truth is I don't have very many examples because this has not been a policy priority, yeah. right? For every education intervention we have, what do we have? Half of a program aimed at strengthening families. This mm -hmm. is 1% of the administration and children and families budget. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the Bush administration ran healthy marriage initiatives. The RCT showed it didn't increase marriage rates. Social scientists poo-pooed it, and we basically gave up on that and said, okay, let's, let's go back to talking about Head Start and child care. Mm -hmm. And I'm all for giving money to Head Start and child care. But in the budget, they get way more money than strengthening families. Mm -hmm. Foster care gets way more money than strengthening families. Child welfare system looks to find, you know, make sure kids are removed from dangerous family situations, but then doesn't help the family, mm -hmm. right? So there are programs around the country that are working to help strengthen families, mm -hmm. meet families where they are. Um, they're operating on the best I can tell, shoestring budgets. And we don't have a very rich research base because this has not been recognized as policy priority. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, like Mathematica has done a bunch of research on like responsible fatherhood programs. None look like, oh my gosh, these are huge increases in successful co-parenting, huge increases in the share of parents that stay together five years later. So this is one of those, if you're skeptical of this line of public support, you look at those and you say, they don't matter. They don't work. Can we go back to talking about supporting with income single parent families? Mm -hmm. it, or you can look at them and say, gosh, they're pointing out real barriers. These programs don't seem to work like the dads say they want to be involved in the kids' lives, but then they're unstably employed. Or then the moms go on and partner with somebody else and don't let the dads in their lives. So, so my challenge would be to, you know, us as policy folks and researchers, to think about innovative ways, you know, rec reading and looking at the descriptive data on what are the barriers we see, what are people saying, and then be willing to invest in it. Mm -hmm. Like our, our, our policy evaluation money, our research energy, our public dollars, we need to be investing in families. And by the way, your friend who comes to you and says, hey, I'm not getting along with the mom, if you convince them, hey, give it a try, you know what they're probably gonna do? They're probably gonna go pay for really high-priced marriage therapy. Mm -hmm. Right? If it's one of my friends from here. Yeah, yeah. If it's one of your friends yeah. from here. But but then like people really bristle at the notion that like public dollars might be available for relationship education yeah. for couples. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, the government does, like the Department of Defense does some of this because military families really struggle. Um, so it's not that there's not like little pockets out there that we could build on, but I just think we really need to be investing in those types of programs. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, again, so happy to see uh, all of you here. I'm especially uh, happy to see so many of my colleagues on AEI's faculty here, and I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So why don't we move to that, even though I could keep asking questions for a long time, which I will do when the event is over. Uh, yes, Tim Carney, right up front. Thank you for 
That would be wonderful. We are not related. We are not related. Uh, <laughs> Tim Carney with a C? With a C, yes. Yeah. So the way it was spelled in Ireland was unacceptable, un, uh, and so we both changed it when, when we no, came No, I'm over. Scatini. This is... <laughs> yeah, yeah. My yeah. <laughs> I meant the Carneys. Um, so first of all, I, I want to uh, reemphasize the uh, hidden message in Mike's last question and say... Uh, don't be a draft dodger in the culture war. <laughs> you have no alternative. You're attacking uh, me for my cowardice. Uh, no, I was subtly I think, doing that, but yeah. No, I was, I was I addressing the message. Ah. You already announced it. You're all in. Just speaking the truth is going to get you attacked by the other side's culture wars. But my question is, how does uh, religion and in different measures of it play in, whether it's attendance or express religiosity to any of these factors? Likelihood to get married, the, uh, the results of the kids, yada, yada. Yeah, I um, I actually am unintentionally silent about that in the book because because I came at this as an economist with a resource based perspective. So I'll be honest, like I didn't do a deep dive into how religion uh, correlates or predicts all of this. I have looked separately at um, unrelated to this book project, but other you know another topic I've been interested in the past few years is why birth rates are down so much and, and what to learn about that. And so one of the uh, you know, explanations often put on the table there is because religious attendance or observance is down. Just descriptively, I don't find a tight correlation. And of course, in the cross section, there's a tight correlation. But the decrease in places that have experienced a larger decrease in religion, I haven't seen a larger decrease in births. So it's separate. But um, it, I think, a little bit speaks to the point that in the cross section, we certainly see all of these things tied together, religious observance and family structure, et cetera. What I don't know is, and if you know of a study that's shown a causal link, things that have sort of exogenously reduced religious attendance, and if we've seen an increase in the kids outside a two-parent family there, I just don't know about the literature because I haven't looked enough. So my uh, friend Richard Ong sends a uh, virtual question. Uh, it's a data question. Are there, are there any data uh, for parents who had vocational education versus college education? So if they don't have, okay, okay, I should actually sort of apologize to everyone once who really nuanced things. One of the best and worst of economics is we try and strip things down to the most basic forms so we can make broad statements. So what I do in the data, because this is one of the big divergences, anybody with four years college degree, I calculate them as a BA. Mm -hmm. If somebody has like an associate's degree or some college that might have been a credential from a vocational school, for, in my data work, they're in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, other questions from the room. Uh, I see Ovik Roy up here at the front. There's a microphone working its way to you. Ovik Roy from the great state of Texas. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having us. Great, uh, great talk. Very interested to, to read the book. Um, in your do's and don'ts, you, you made all the appropriate caveats about we don't want to keep people in abusive, violent marriages, et cetera. But surely there are things we can do to make divorce harder and make the marriage contract more of a contract like it used to be. I mean, we've obviously liberalized divorce considerably, famously Ronald Reagan did in, in, in California. Have we gone too far? What's your opinion about that? There's a there's, you know, I struggle to say anything because we also know that making divorce easier has made it more feasible for people to escape violent marriages. So I, you know, I am, not prepared to advocate for changes in divorce policy, less controversially, but still a bit of a punt. I don't even really have very much specific to say about child support, because just as a fact of matter, and this is related to divorce, child support enforcement is really, or child support receipt, only a quarter of unpartnered mothers receive child support. So this is another place where it's like, well, clearly we need to make, you know, we need to beef up enforcement of child support. But then once you start looking at the evidence on different approaches to child support, you get some really unintended consequences. Like if it's easier to collect child support, you actually get less time with the dad or less marriage because that's an alternative. And so some moms might rather not be married to the guy if she's guaranteed to get some income from him and not be married. So like divorce policy is one where I'm like, I'm not sure what the right answer is. Um, Child support enforcement is another one where it seems like seems like we don't quite have it right, but I'm not sure what the right answer is. The other thing I will say about um, just the question of has, have we gone too far, 
you know, this really gets to the question of marginal versus average in some sense. Like, as it's become easier to divorce, as it's become more socially acceptable to have kids outside marriage, is the marginal marriage or the marginal divorce, would that perhaps be more beneficial to the child, even if, um, you know, just because the increment, it, it's not as an extreme a situation, right? So, so the divorce is now, let's say, more optional, we don't like each other as much, as opposed to, I really need to get out of this terrible marriage that's harmful. So, I, so that's, you know, it's a punt, because I'm not, because it's very complicated to reform these systems without having unintended consequences, but I do think those are the types of questions we should be asking. I think Vince Smith has a question in the back. Uh, well, in some ways, I've got a brief comment in that, uh, about 20 years ago, I and a collected a detailed study of alcohol and drug abuse on American Indian reservations, uh, where it turned out that 38% of adults between 16 and 64 could be diagnosed as DSM-3 or DSM-4. That means intensive counseling or uh, in, in, uh, in, so in facility health. So I backed that out and said that means that only one out of every three American <coughs> children has a hope of having two parents who are not, uh, one of which is not subject to alcohol and drug abuse. And one in three almost certainly has both parents in that situation. In that situation, to what extent, and these are low-income families, of course, where 80% live below the poverty line, that's a characterization of a community that has got serious problems, period. Does any notion of improving the marriage rate in those communities make much sense? So, I'm just trying to give you an example yeah. that is contradistinction to the example that Michael gave you of his friend. So, so I think this is where we think about sort of the immediate solutions versus sort of the long term, right? So immediately, I think most of us would say, gosh, if these are, these are parents who are really unable to provide a safe and nurturing home for their child, well, what do we do now? We have child support, and for, we have um, child welfare services take the parent away, take the children away, we try and stabilize the parent. We don't do much to strengthen the family. So my immediate response is, we, you know, we can't just, we, we have to help families where they are. Like kids in our country deserve this. So my immediate solution is, but marriage at that point becomes like secondary and it's like how do we strengthen this family where they are what can we do for the kids and and I think it needs to be more than just an expanded child tax credit or a child allowance which I am all for okay let's give them two thousand three thousand dollars but the kids need more than that they need a stable place to live so I would also say we should be doubling down on these programs to help the family but in a longer term sense this is why I'm sort of pulling back and saying Look, all of these labor market challenges that we talk about, all of this social malaise that we talk about, this has had major consequences for the way kids in this country are growing up. And we can't just keep putting Band-Aid solutions out there. We can't just keep hiring counselors in school, right? We have trauma-informed education for teachers. We actually, at some point, have to focus back on what's happening to the families and what kind of environments are these kids growing up in. And so in some sense, you know, it's a good example of like, here's a family, maybe the parents shouldn't live together. Let's get them the resources they need to effectively co-parent and make the best of the situation. But in the longer term, we should challenge ourselves to do better than that and, and try and create a society where more kids are born to parents who are well-equipped to be together and take care of them in a healthy, stable two-parent setting. Let's see, we started a little late, so maybe we can go a little late. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, thank you so much for the interesting subject. I have a question. Uh, do you think that the adult entertainment industry has had negative impact on the marriage rate? Okay, so <laughs> I, 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 if I were going to list all the things that I didn't look at, I might have thought to look at religion before I looked at that, so I don't know. Has that been studied <laughs> So I don't know, I don't know, but I will tell you anecdotally, uh, in the past like six months, I've been talking to a lot of people who run these sort of programs with, with families in affected communities, and almost to a person, 
every one of them who runs sort of relationship education, responsible fatherhood programs, healthy relationships for high schoolers, every one of them, I think, has brought up this issue and said, what am I supposed to do? All of these young men are just watching porn on their phones all day. Talk about depressing. I mean, let's go back to my fracking study because that's much less depressing than this. So anecdotally, you hear that from people who are working on this, and that gets to like, how do we, how do we foster healthy relationships in this country? But I don't know of any sort of causal evidence. Or my instinct is to dismiss the porn hypothesis, but it sounds like you're. I, I, I don't. I don't know. I'm just saying. Yeah. I've been hearing more and more of that anecdotally of people who are trying to work with couples on healthy relationships that anecdotally they see this mm -hmm. as a problem. Interesting. Um, okay, why don't we do uh, one more, and let's make sure your question is short and ends with a question mark. Uh, sir. Um, on your list of do's and don'ts, you said that governments uh, should try to support marriage with government programs, but that they should also not attempt to uh, withhold welfare. Um, how do you reconcile this question of moral hazard? Um, you know, if you give married parents more welfare than single parents, single parents are the ones that are more in poverty. So how can you reconcile yeah, that? Yeah, I figured I wasn't going to get out of AI difficulty. without having to grapple with this. OK, so this is an excellent point. And because there is a trade-off here. So I do say very clearly, have a stronger safety net for families, regardless of family structure. So the low-hanging fruit. Um, is at the very least, let's get rid of the marriage penalties in our tax and transfer systems, right? So at the very least, we should not be penalizing couples for getting married, which a lot of our tax structure and transfer eligibility programs do. I don't think that's going to dramatically turn things around, but we shouldn't be disincentivizing marriage with the way we design our programs. That said, and of course, we should never go back to like the AFDC structure where like you can't have a man in the house or you lose all your benefits, right? All of that. That said, I do, this is back to meeting families where they are. I do feel very strongly that kids who are born into under-resourced families through no fault of their own should not be left to linger or languish in material deprivation out of a misguided notion that if we just withhold support, maybe they're parents will decide they have no choice but to get married. So I will take this trade-off of a stronger safety net, even though I will fully concede that that might lead incrementally to some reduction in marriage between parents, which might sound odd given everything I've been saying. But my read of the evidence on this is that more generous welfare does lead to some increase in single parenthood, but it is tiny. And we have mounds of evidence that alleviating the material deprivation of children has long-term benefits. So that is a trade that I'm very comfortable advocating for. So I think you have as a goal not to engage in the culture war. And I, think, I know, I'm in it. I think you've, I think you've <laughs> largely succeeded. But what, what, I, what, what I would characterize uh, your work as entering into the culture war, but uh, leavening it with facts and with sound analysis uh, and with uh, empirical research, adding light to a discussion that is basically entirely characterized by heat. And I think that uh, is uh, in the best tradition of, uh, of public intellectuals who are serious social scientists. So I'm so happy that you have written this book, and I think that the conversation that it is uh, that it is really starting, or, or 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 at least advancing, has benefited enormously already by the fact that you are in it, and by the fact that this book exists. And I want to thank you for spending a little time Very here generous. at AI yeah. with us. Thank today. you. Thank you, everyone.